Amanda Lindout is the co-founder and executive director of the Global Enrichment Foundation. I've recently gotten to know Amanda over the course of planning this summit, and I have met very few people in my life who are such an incredible force for positive change. Um, and I couldn't imagine a better moderator for this panel. Amanda's foundation looks at everything from the plight of women in Somalia uh, to issues of violent extremism in the same location. Amanda began her career after finishing her education as a journalist in different war-torn parts of the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in 2008, she went to Somalia, uh, where she initially arrived in Mogadishu. Uh, not long after arriving in Mogadishu to cover what was happening as a result of the drought and the famine and the years and decades of violence, Amanda was kidnapped by Al-Shabaab teenagers, held hostage for 460 days. Amanda was released in 2009, and in what I think we would all agree is a remarkable and illustrative example of what a positive force she, she is, immediately decided that the way she was going to translate her experience was through the positive change that focuses on women and the plight of the people in Somalia. Amanda, stage is yours. Thanks so much, Jared. And also thanks to Google Tribeca and the CFR for facilitating this important meeting. It's a real honor to be here. Over the last few days, I've had the pleasure of getting to know these panelists on the stage, all of whom are very inspiring individuals with really remarkable stories. So let's just go down the line here, and I'll have each of you briefly introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from and a little bit about your current organizations. Let's start with you, Mo. My name is uh, Mohammed, or Mo Mohammed. I was born in Somalia, but I grew up and was educated in Canada. I currently have an organization called Generation Islam, which is basically geared towards stopping young Somali Western kids or Canadian kids from joining radical groups like Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda. Thanks. Henry? Yeah, Henry Robinson. Uh, I currently am um, an advisor to uh, Almost self-help group. They were the, the victim survivors of the uh, real IRA bomb, um, and also I give some advice to the Brixton Street Project, very important project in Brixton, who uh, work with young uh, people who are vulnerable to, to exploitation, joining knife gun gangs and uh, extremist uh, organisations. Osama. With the name of God. I'm an imam and academic based in London. I, I teach at university artificial intelligence and astronomy. And I work with the Muslim community, uh, especially in, in counter-extremism, and developing a, a theology and interpretation of the Quran which is appropriate for the societies we live in, and especially to wrestle it away from the extremists and the preachers of hate. And James. Peace be with you all. Um, I work with the Interfaith Mediation Center based in Nigeria. Um, what we do there is that we intervene in conflict situation and try to reduce what we call religious motivated violence, uh, working with young people, women, and religious leaders uh, in Nigeria and across uh, Nigeria, wherever we found ourselves, we go doing the same work. Thank you. Thanks. So this panel is called Crossing the Threshold, Justifying and Renouncing Violence. And we're going to explore some of the causes that make someone who holds extreme ideas turn to violence and then how they justify that. So all of you were quite young when you joined the organizations that you were part of. So let's talk about what was so alluring to you at that young age and what it was that motivated you initially to cross that fine line from having a, a personal or a nationalist or a religious ideology into violent extremism. Was there a specific moment or a set of circumstances that prompted you to take violent action and cross that threshold? So Henry, I'm gonna start with you. In Ireland, you lived in a community with a large religious population who felt that they were discriminated against. Yet most members of your community didn't turn to violence in the same way that you did. So why did you? I, I don't think there's one incident that really turns you into uh, an extremist. I think you come, 
my story, particularly where I came from, a community uh, who would have perceived discrimination against them, and there was real discrimina discrimination in the 60s and whatnot. So the reason why I eventually joined a terrorist organization was probably different from where I began. Uh, and uh, I think the, when, I, when I saw in the late 60s, the uh, Catholic families coming out of Belfast who were being burned out of their homes, I was maybe eight or nine years old. Um, and uh, there was one particular incident where we were, my family were sitting in a car in a petrol station and uh, there was a car beside us and there was a woman, woman in the car crying. My mother made my father go across to see what was going on and this was one of the families who'd been burnt out, Catholic family who'd been burnt out of Belfast and they came and lived uh, with us for days and I think that had a big impact on me. Now, what I didn't realise at the time was there were both sections of the community uh, that kind of violence was happening to both sets of the, of the community, Protestant community as well. Um, so then, Without full knowledge, I, you began to make decisions which lead you on a path to um, extremism. And uh, some years later, uh, my, my simple analysis would have been, if coming from a Catholic community, I wanted to be somebody, I wanted to belong. And the IRA uh, were, were, looked a cool organization to me. Uh, I almost joined the, uh, the more extreme um, IRA, provisional IRA, but then that was purely a nationalist movement back then. And as I began to understand uh, more, I became more attracted to the more Marxist-Leninist socialist movement, which, which was the official IRA they called an early ceasefire, but it still had an army or a military wing. So I became more attracted to the politics of that. So that was a gradual transition from, from being in a more religiously motivated faction of the group to, to being more nationalist. Yeah, I mean, as, as I understood more, uh, I wanted to be more revolutionary, I wanted to be more um, idealistic, uh, so that the more Marxist official IRA group attracted me more. And uh, then once you get into the, a, a group like the official IRA, then you've got to defend its members, its ideology, and uh, that's when you uh, cross over. Right. James, what did that moment of crossing over violence look like to you as a young man in Nigeria? Um, thank you again. To put it into proper perspective, um, I was born and, uh, in 1960, and my father joined the Biafran War in 1966. He came home from war front with grenades, with rifle, and that was my first interaction with things that are like dangerous weapons. He told me how to detonate the, the grenade that I should never touch that pin or pull it out or it will blow the whole house. And I got interested in learning, watching war films, uh, war comics, uh, cowboy films. And that interests me and I kept going on and on until in my brain in 1970, we started war between my community and the community across just when I was just about seven years. So I have a scar on my head of stones that we threw across each other, like um, uh, mimicking our fathers in the war front, and I grew up in the barrack. So my uh, uh, sense of uh, struggle to be a, a strong person uh, just came naturally. I became a natural leader among my peers. And, and so um, given the history in my country, as mentioned by my colleague Imam Ashafer, there are certain injustices that we saw happening across board. And at the slightest provocation, religious uh, groups will come on the other. And it became imperative on me to begin to groom some young people to checkmate uh, our colleagues, our brothers on the other side. And at that point, like I said, my hate for Muslims had no limits. And killing a Muslim at any point is nothing to me. It's just like doing the normal thing. So I use the scriptures, the Bible, to demonize the others and justify why violence should be. So crossing over to me was the same spirituality I found within the Bible after being processed by somebody who wanted me uh, to be a preacher to the Muslims and said to me, James, you can't preach Christ with the kind of hate you have for the Muslims. You need to love them. And that was my turning point. And I came back to meet Imam. Uh, the irony of it is this. For three years we've been working with Imam, I announced the ambition of killing him. Because uh, I, I lost my hand and I felt uh, he was indirectly responsible. 
And, and for that reason, killing him will have uh, augmented for my hands. And he helps me, and each time he helps me, I don't appreciate it. I see him as doing penance for my hand. But since that very orientation in Abuja, after working with him for three years and tormented by hate, I met my turning point, and I came back loving. And now the love I have for him is infectious. If you get close to us, you'll catch the flu. <laughs> Thanks, James. We'll talk about your, your turning point back to the other side a little bit more in a minute. So, Mo, your story is a little bit different because you're, you're a staunch Somali nationalist, but yet you joined the very religiously motivated group Al-Shabaab to free Somalia from the occupying forces. So, can you tell us about the moment that your nationalist ideology prompted you to pick up a weapon? To be a nationalist, it doesn't just come in because you want to be, you know, imitate someone. I was, God made me born to a family of political power within Somalia. My great great father was the founding father of the Somali Republic. I grew up in North America. I was just a young man who went to university in Canada, graduated with a political science degree to follow my great grandfather's political field and went to law school in Australia. And I believe what every North American kid believed, which is we can change the world, we can make a difference. So I said, maybe I should go back to Somalia, the only country on the planet Earth that doesn't have a government. 2004 was Somalia. So I joined in an effort to make Somalia a democratic republic so I can practice my political education in Somalia. I was then accepted as the Deputy Prime Minister's Chief of Staff for Politics and Security. So we coordinated the ability to make Somalia safe and free from Al-Qaeda-inspired Islamic Course Union. But the turning point happened, the people, the regional coordinating body that was supposed to work with us basically committed the sin that broke the back of us. And that is what made not only me, but half of the cabinet and half of the parliament and half of the army, 10,000 and more, that were trained by US money, completely one day switched side and said, we are under occupation. Somali people will no longer exist if we follow this road. So we had to do whatever we can to make sure the essence of being Somali stays alive in Africa. That's why we switch side, coming from, you know, I want to help put something in effort, my education, my Western education, put it into practice, make a democratic, stable Somalia. I ended up being the one that brings the army that occupies Somalia and flows the, cap the presidential palace, our arch enemies for 5,000 years, their flag. So, I felt, and my whole, I mean, the half of the cabin, including the deputy prime minister who was my boss, a former American Marine, we quit. And we decided to switch sides, and the only viable organization to fight at that time was Al-Shabaab. But don't you have some story? Weren't you captured by another group, and Al-Shabaab actually helped free you? When when the, uh, I mean, when uh, the army that was supposed to, when there was a struggle to resign, my father called me, he was the chief, one of the most powerful people in the capital city. He called me and he said, I want you to explain to me, why is this flag flying on our presidential palace? Because my tribe is asking me that question. And I need an answer, so come for a, ch no, for a lunch. So I, I left the presidential palace, I went to my father, and I said, we don't agree with this. As I was talking to my father, a battalion of the same army that was on, my, on our team to fight the Al-Qaeda surrounded the whole neighborhood, and they knock, knock our room. My father said, show your badge. So I brought my badge, and I said, I'm a member of the transition of federal government. I'm the chief of the staff of the deputy prime minister and minister of interior. I'm in charge of a lot of things. I am, this is my ID. This is the president, phone number, mobile, and this is the prime minister mobile. You can call him right now. He took out my ID, ripped it apart, and he said, 
I don't care if you're a TFG, Transition of Federal Government of Somalia, or Al-Shabaab. To me, you are same, same. All Somalis are same to me. You killed my father in 1977 war. He said, kill him. Me and my father, the chief of the biggest tribe, were made naked, beaten up, and almost about to be executed. God forbid, the young Shabab that I was fighting against them Came saved in my to life. Save you. Saved my yeah. life and my father. Right. So, okay, so a sense of gratitude there as well, I'm sure. And Osama, why did you cross that line? As a young person growing up in the UK with a deep belief in Islam, did you always see violence as a legitimate means of dealing with conflict that threatened your religion? Or was there an event that compelled you to head to Afghanistan to fight? It, it was mainly scripture, actually. Um, as you said, I grew up in a very devout household. Um, tried to remain a devout Muslim all my life and was involved with, with very devout Muslim groups, which is strong, strongly politicized. A couple of my colleagues are here. Um, and I'm the type of person who doesn't kill spiders or doesn't hurt a fly, literally. But uh, certainly the teaching of jihad in, in the Quran are very powerful. I think we have that in all religions, a militant tradition. And uh, for young people, all the political Islamist groups at the time were teaching jihad is a, is a noble obligation. Uh, it, it is your duty as a Muslim man to, to fight jihad at least once in your lifetime or be prepared for it all the time. And so when the opportunity came, uh, which it did in 1990, to actually go and take part in that uh, jihad against the Afghan communists, you know, I did so. And later, some of my friends fought and died in, in Bosnia and Chechnya. But those at the time, those were the right decisions. Those were the uh, um, justified causes. Um, but it, it was especially the inspiration for, from scripture, from the Quran. Okay. So as part of these groups, you all felt that, that violence against your perceived enemies was justified. But I'm interested to know how you reconciled the civilian deaths that would have occurred because of your actions and the actions of the groups that you were involved with. Did you feel that, that those were justified? Mo, I'm, I'm personally interested in, in your perspective on this because you were fighting alongside Al-Shabaab in 2008, which is the same year that I was, was kidnapped in Somalia. And you've said to me that you were fighting for the country and not for their religious ideology that they use to justify the kidnapping of me. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you justify fighting alongside a group involved in violence that you fundamentally didn't believe in? For example, the taking of hostages. Mogadishu had a two and a half million the first time the Ethiopian army rolled into the capital city. Three weeks later, the capital city of Mogadishu of two and a half million, there was next to 100,000 people left. Everyone else house was literally bombarded, bulldozed, the mosques were used as toilets to humiliate. Islamic mosque is, is, is sacred. When all the houses, people run away and they're all empty, why would you have to go to a mosque to use it as a toilet? That humiliation and that anger of many Somalis didn't even focus on civilians. They were like, this is genocide. Right. We have to do what we have to do to survive. So what I'm asking you is, how did you reconcile with yourself the violence that the group that you were associated with, when, when you didn't buy into that, th their religious ideology that they were inflicting on others? So foreigners and, and locals, for example, um, the stoning of women in the communities, etc. One time I was uh, cautioned by a Shabab commander. We had to go to a stadium and a lot of young people recruited, we had to, I had to make a speech by, and, and I was told to give a speech and I said, I spoke from my heart, I wasn't thinking. But then I, was, I said, I don't care to thousands of young men passionate to die for this cause. I said, I don't care if you are a Jewish Somali or a Christian Somali or a Shabab Somali. I said, what matters to me is that you are a Somali and you're defending the right to exist in this part of the world. And I was immediately 
important by the Shabab commander Abu Mansur, the Somali guy. He said to me, don't ever say Somali Jewish, Somali Christian. You said once, that's it. Don't ever say that. That was one thing that I realized that these guys are not fighting, first of all, the same vision I had for Somalia, but the anger of me, member of the team that was fighting to save Somalia from radicals, being made naked and my father blindfolded naked and, br and about to be executed, that was always repeating as a tape in my head. For me, I could care less anything else but get this invading force out of my land. Okay. That's okay. it. Yeah. Osama, you and I talked yesterday actually quite a bit, a bit about this, you know, how, how in war we can reconcile these civilian casualties. I'd like you to share that with everybody. Well, we can't actually. Well, we can't, <laughs> but how, you, how, how it's done. Yeah, I, I, th I think one thing we have to realize is that a lot of the terrorism is a reaction to the nature of modern warfare. In the 20th century, you know, millions of people died in war. With, with the technology and the weapons we have now, any war will inevitably um, involve large numbers of civilian deaths. And of course, the, the civilized militaries around the world do try to minimize that, but they accept it as, as collateral damage. And uh, one of the, the big mistakes Al-Qaeda made, made, of course, was they used the verses of the Quran which speak about an eye for an eye. And they literally said, they kill our civilians. This was the, the grievance narrative that the Americans, or the Israelis uh, specifically, especially the Indians in Kashmir, uh, and supported by the Americans and, and Western powers, go around killing thousands of Muslim civilians. And, and therefore, we are justified in, uh, in killing them in return. And there are large numbers of, of religious clerics around the world who, who, who promoted that um, interpretation. It, it wasn't only bin Laden uh, who was doing that. And uh, so although I've never supported the targeting of civilians, but you know, one of the most influential religious clerics in the Muslim world today will be in Dublin for five days from tomorrow. And his fatwa still is that there is no such thing as an Israeli civilian, for example, because that deep-seated rage um, uh, against Israel or the Israeli-Palestinian issue is so strong. So, so for him, all, uh, all Israelis are legitimate targets, for example. And uh, it's, it's controlling those feelings of anger and trying to bring them in line with the noble ethics of jihad or, 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 or warfare in general, which is a really difficult struggle. And personally, I went back to Afghanistan last year, spent a week in Helmand and saw both sides, spent time with the NATO forces and also uh, spoke to the Afghan locals, etc. The only way I can reconcile all this is to say we must stop war, we must have preemptive peace, um, we must tr strive to abolish war actually. There's a movement for the abolition of war uh, launched in, in the UK by many leading academics and thinkers. Um, because once war starts, wherever it is around the world, it is an extremely terrible situation and uh, causes immense suffering. And I think our challenge for this century, certainly as humanity, is to really struggle hard to eradicate the notion of, of war as a first resort. War was always supposed to be a last resort, a kind of necessary evil. But now we should think about seriously about eliminating it completely. Right, and James, just briefly, you said yesterday um, that in war, Numbers of dead are numbers of achievement. So can you explain that to us in relation to my last question about how w when you were a fighter, you, you reconciled the civilian death tolls? Thank you again. In my community in Nigeria, we count the number of laws on the neighbors uh, on our enemy's side. So you ask how many were killed on that side? And you see, within three days, you could have thousands of people dead, uh, like in the 2000 Sharia crisis. Uh, we, we were counting how many mosques did we destroy? How many churches did they destroy? How many death toll was on the side of the Muslims? How many death toll was on the side of the uh, Christians? So the issue is strike first, strike devastated, uh, devastatedly, make sure you destroy a lot in the first uh, uh, 6 to 12 hours of your attack and fall out. So that at the end, those people that fall casualties, it's not really what matters. We are not thinking of civilians, military, we are thinking of people. And once you wear a religion, you are militarized by your identity. 
So whether it's a woman, a boy, a child, whatever, if you identify yourself, you are legitimately okay for elimination. So um, we don't see people, the vulnerable dying as casualty, as any collateral damages. We see everybody who is identified by a particular faith as um, legitimately uh, okay for elimination. So we count our gains by the number of deaths. Okay. Mo, just back to you for a minute. Um, you were born and raised in Toronto, Canada. You have multiple university degrees. And I, I've heard you argue that Islamic minority groups in Western countries face discrimination and oppression. And that's often why they go back to their, their homelands and join these extremist groups. But why don't we see then, for example, why other minority groups um, engaging in terrorism in the same kinds of numbers as, as, as the Muslim groups, when it could be argued that they face the same types of challenges in our Western countries? It is just, it is simple answer. That's very easy to answer. I asked uh, about 12 young, after I opened Generation Islam, I had a, a discussion with, after Friday prayers, with about 15 young, mostly Somalis, but there were Afghanis and Pakistanis also, a couple guys that were friends with them. And we were, uh, and, I, and I asked them a question, what would, what would make you, uh, what did, and they told me a story that touched my heart, basically, that they were talking about me. They said, we, t we were told to stay in school, to stay out of trouble, since kindergarten from elementary school, high school. If you stay in school, you stay out of trouble. If you don't become a gang member, if you don't sell drugs, if you get a chance to go to high school in Canada and you finish high school, you will get a job in Canada. But if you graduate a university, you will have a chance in the Canadian dream. That was a lie. That's, everyone said that. And I just looked at them and they said, what are you doing right now? Look at yourself. And basically, it, it hit me. They, we, we, I mean, I grew up in a government housing where 80% of my high school, when I was going to high school, 80% of my time, I, I never had a chance to eat a breakfast to go to school compared to other people. But There's many other minority groups that face similar challenges, but they're, they're not engaging in acts of violence. But there's an added opposition, a, an organization called Al-Qaeda. They, they are richer than Canada. They have a big, powerful organization that's fighting all of NATO in Afghanistan, in Somalia, and Yemen. They don't want a young... Canadian, Christian, or a Jew, or a Jamaican drug dealer, or something like that in, in the ghettos. What they need is young, angry, Muslim, Canadian, or American to recruit them to use against them. So that we're pressure. About sophisticated propaganda and marketing tools from the extremist groups like Al Qaeda. Most of the young men that I talked to were told by a cleric, one of the kid told me a story, but he said, I don't want to reveal my name. He said, I was, I mean, I was approached in a mosque by a, a cleric, and he said to me, the reason you can't get a job is because you are a Muslim. After September 11, because of being a Muslim, you are the enemy of this country. And he said, if you want to, you know, if you want to fight back, I'll give you an opportunity to fight back, which means he was recruiting him to go overseas like what happened in, in Birmingham, 7-7, where three generation Pakistani British were recruited from the UK, taken to Pakistan, trained them, and they came back to the UK to go to their apartment, put everything they had, put a rack sack, went to the subway, kaboom. I, I think there's a problem with that uh, insofar as uh, the example you gave about the British um, extremists. They had brilliant jobs, so they weren't excluded. They, they had got all the opportunity and still uh, became members of uh, an extreme organization and murdered a lot of people. And um, I think when you've got a, a community, whether it's your community in Canada, I think you've got a responsibility to integrate. And if you're not given a job, the response is not to say, um, these people might become extremism because you're not treating them fairly. I think the response is to counter that uh, discrimination via law and everything else. And I think uh, there is a responsibility to uh, in integrate, essentially, that's what I'm saying. I agree with you, but the answer from the young people will be like, first of all, I'm young, 
I'm angry and alienated and frustrated. And I'll tell you, this is what they told me. They said, if I played by the rule, what the, the rules that you set for me, if I played by the rule with tremendous hardship and I achieved something and you closed the door in my face, which means to me, you don't want me. If you don't want me, then fine. I pack my bags and I leave. I, I don't care where I go, that's not your business. I can join anywhere I want. If you don't want me to live with an honorable way of earning, an, an honest way of means of survival, then if you don't want me, why are you tell me to stay? If you don't want me, I pack my bags. I have an option that you non-Muslims don't have to fight back, I which is I have Al-Qaeda to fight back to my anger and punish you. I think what we That's can what draw is. out of that, yes, is that these groups are well-funded, they're very sophisticated in, the, in their propaganda, mm. and they're using this jihadi narrative, Osama, which is something that maybe you can shed some light on for me, because it's my understanding that, that fighting is incumbent on any Muslim male as long as there is war and oppression in Muslim countries, as it's stated in the Quran, and that it's justified in defense of the religion and the community. So where do you see the, lawn, dr the line drawn between the defense of Islam and acts of terrorism? What you actually said is the... Uh is an extreme interpretation which is over politicized so the Quran teaches like like any system of laws that in self-defense in certain situations you have the right to defend yourself um, the, the idea that you know we are a global nation but we're also all brothers and sisters in humanity we, we care about everybody um, that, that doesn't mean you go and do irrational action so the Quran itself in a famous verse even says you, you help your Muslim brother unless you have a treaty uh, with the group um, who's oppressing them. You can't actually fight against them. So, for example, British and American and European citizens who are Muslim uh, cannot fight against their own states or, or their own armies even, even if they disagree with, with wars ab abroad. So, so there are many levels of jihad. You know, there's the inner jihad, the spiritual struggle, there's the jihad with the, with, with the tongue and uh, with wealth for, for noble causes. They're speaking the truth to a tyrant ruler. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said was the greatest jihad. You know, the Arab Spring, I see the, the peaceful version of that as an example of that. The Prophet said serving your uh, parents in their old age is a jihad. When we were younger, we used to say, oh, forget all this uh, flowery, Sufi, spiritual stuff about inner struggle. We're just interested in, in the guns and the, uh, and the bombs and things. But uh, as, as we've got older, we've realized, you know, the, when you look carefully at the verses of the Quran, actually they're saying the exact opposite. That, that jihad is the last resort. The, the essence of, of the Quran in Islam is about love of God, the mercy of God. Every chapter of the Quran begins with the name of the mercy, which are very close to the biblical idea of love. Uh, it's about forgiveness. We have uh, chapters about forgiveness. The, uh, the longest story in the Quran, which is, uh, has the most powerful verses about jihad, is actually called repentance. It's a chapter on repentance and turning to, uh, to God, literally a U-turn away from wrong and, and, and turning back to God. So uh, we're trying very hard now to reclaim the idea of jihad away from the fanatical interpretations. Uh, just last month in London, we launched the Jihad Against Violence, which was originally launched in New York, to, to try to reclaim the idea, you know, and promote the idea of Jihad against discrimination or against apartheid or against uh, uh, oppression, whatever it is, but uh, especially in peaceful ways, uh, whenever possible, because now we can see violence begets more violence, and we don't want blood feuds and cycles of violence going on for, for decades. Right, so as we're winding down the panel, I'd like to hear from each of you um, how you've renounced violence. Earlier we heard that that was a process and it's not necessarily a moment. So share with us how that process started and where you're at now. James, you were once quoted as saying your hatred of Islam has no bounds. So how did you turn away from that? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, to hate, one is programmed to hate by what he see, or by participation, or by history. People tell you, some mothers program us from our wombs and say, these people are less important than you. So they are, uh, this is what they have done, and that is what they have done to you. So you grow up with uh, what we call anger that is not trans, uh, transformed then you transfer it on the immediate personality that tends to uh, f uh, 
that forms to conform with that story that you have been told. So as a young person, this programming got me to a point that I started flipping through my Bible to identify verses that I can use to inform young men and women on the fact that their enemies are the Muslims. And of course, there are certain happenings that also give credence to some of those um, uh, positions. And then you use it for that to buttress your point. I told you, you see what they have done, you see what they have done, and you recruit them easily and get them um, programmed now to hate the other. And you demonize the other to justify killing them. So this process, it takes a longer time to re-deprogram the people. For us, as I have said, when I met my turning point, like I shared earlier, that the same reason for which I hate the Muslim was turned around, and I was said as a pastor. I was re really preaching already, but I had never preached to a Muslim with the aim of converting him, but her, or just a testimony against the person in Judgment Day. My message is repent or you perish. And that is just to satisfy all necessary commandments, but not for the person to repent. You don't wait for that. So the same process, there was this missions to reach out to what they call the uh, Northern Nigeria. And because I speak Hausa fluently, I'm not Hausa, I'm Baggy, and uh, I was recruited. And they say, James, we know you and we know your hate for the Muslims. You can't preach Christ with this kind of hate. It turned me around completely. That was, that was my turning point. And since then, it's like a weight has been taken off my shoulder. The scale has fallen off my eyes. And I say, if there is anything now that you need to do to your Muslim colleague or brother, is try to outwit him or her in doing good. So if there are coins of love, how many coins of love can you offer against what he can offer you? It's not preaching Christ, but living like him. Living the religion by actually practi practicalizing it and being pragmatic, not talking the talking, but doing the doing, which is in the faith. Thank you, James. It's beautiful. Very inspiring. Um, Osama, just as we're wrapping up here, what was your turning point? Well, 9-11 was, was a major turning point. I began my soul searching, uh, because, unfortunately, because of my jihad connections before that, I had some sympathy for Al-Qaeda, uh, and because of the grievance narrative um, against US, because of the Israeli-Palestinian situation. I'm now a patron of two charities in the UK working on Israeli-Palestinian uh, dialogue, etc. I did that soul searching. Um, and I, I had realized we had to give up this violence because it was so counterproductive and a deeper reading of the scripture showed it was never the intention in the first place. And the last straw was the July the 7th bombing because that was my own city uh, being bombed and very close to my heart. I was really traumatized by that. Thanks, Osama. Mo, very quickly, you have a, an interesting story about that moment for you that involves seeing the Al-Qaeda flag being raised. Do you want to share that quickly? We one time went to, uh, we, were, we fought a battle, we liberated a town, and I, I started fighting, picking up the gun when the, when the Ethiopians raised their flag on top of my, and, and put down my Somali flag. But the guys I'm fighting with are doing the exact same thing. When we liberated a town, the first thing the uh, foreign Mujahideens did was take the Somali flag down and bring, put the Al-Qaeda flag. Half of the guys were, from the United States and Canada, young people who, who wanted to fight for the country, they revolted. They said, I don't know this black flag, but I fought for that blue flag, the Somali flag. So because when I saw that both were the same, Shabab and Ethiopia both didn't want the Somali flag, I said, enough with you. I'm not fighting for Al-Qaeda and Caliphate rubbish. I'm only fighting for my country to be free and democratic and stable. And you're taking down my flag? I've had enough, and I just walked out. Okay. And Henry, what was that turning point for you? I think there were a number of turning points, but I think one I, I vividly, vividly remember was being in prison and being beaten up by a rebel paramilitary group and getting my head stitched uh, and in the hospital wing and looking at t television. Wimbledon was on television, people playing tennis, eating strawberries. I think the normality of it just struck me. <laughs> I went, wow, there may be a better way to live. But what? what what I'd like to say, Amanda, is that uh, I'm really delighted that uh, 
we are having this conference because I've never really been in a room before with so many uh, former extremists and survivors. I think that's a very powerful combination. And for me, if something could come out of this conference, that we would all go away, just to steal a line from James has been dismantlers of violent extremism. And one thought I'd like to leave you with is that the, the language you use, I think, is very important. We've got to be careful with it. The previous panelists were talking about fundamentalism uh, and radicalism. And I think the term radicalization is kind of like a busted flush. It's lost its meaning. It's almost become the mean uh, Muslims we don't like, and I think that's not helpful. Great, well let's give this panel a round of applause. Thank you.